Aristotle once said that gold was water solidified in the ground and mixed with the sun's rays. Others were sure that gold was made with the help of the philosopher's stone. When the ancient Incas first saw gold, they decided that this metal, falling from the sky, was the tears of a mythical creature. But its real origin seems much more epic. Let's go to a very distant past, to the time when there were no people or animals, to the time when dinosaurs didn't exist yet, to the era when the simplest forms of life were just being formed. Our planet resembled a huge cauldron of chemical elements. There were erupting volcanoes, earthquakes, and lightning flashes all the time. It was about 3.9 billion years ago. During this period, huge asteroids flew through our solar system. They fell on Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. It's possible that asteroids also fell on the moon and left large craters on it. There was a real apocalypse on our planet. But fortunately, no one felt it because there was no life yet. Along with the destruction, the asteroids brought metals. But were there metals on Earth before that? Of course. The core of our planet is mainly made up of metals such as iron. From there, it spreads to Earth's crust, mixes with magma, comes into contact with oxygen, and combines with other elements. But how did they get into the core? Simple hydrogen and helium atoms merged and formed heavier elements inside giant stars. Then, supernovae exploded and formed big clouds of dust and gas. These clouds reached our galaxy and began to revolve around the sun. Over time, this dust and the remnants of stars formed planets. One of them was our Earth. Metals lying in the bowels of our planet are difficult to get. And we wouldn't have the technology we have now if it wasn't for that meteor shower that left metals on Earth's surface. There are two theories. The first suggests that powerful supernova explosions far from our universe formed a lot of metals from the periodic table. During the explosion, nuclear fusion started and it created atoms of gold. Then the blast wave threw those hot pieces in different directions. They flew for a long time, cooled down in cold space, and reached our solar system. Another theory says that gold and other metals appeared because of the merger of two neutron stars. These are powerful giant stars that are many times smaller in size than the sun, but several times heavier than it. These are objects with tremendous gravitational force and density. Their collision formed an intense gamma ray burst of radiation that could synthesize gold. In 2017, astrophysicists observed the collision of two neutron stars for the first time. They found traces of heavy metals, including gold, using gravitational wave detectors. So this theory seems more likely. And what if we go even further? Where did stars come from? Clouds of dust and gas are scattered throughout the universe. They mix, combine into one mass, and grow like a snowball. They squeeze each other and form a gravitational force. When all the material collapses, it starts to heat up. And then, this surge of energy creates a star. Some physicists assume that stars, during their lifetime, can produce most of the elements of the periodic table. If this theory is true, then our body also consists of stars. We may be part of some gigantic supernova that exploded billions of years ago at the other end of the universe. More than 50 years have passed since the appearance of this theory, but no one has proved or disproved it. Okay, let's get back to gold. One of the largest gold deposits in the world is in southern Africa. Scientists believe that the precious metal appeared there more than two billion years ago after the fall of a giant meteorite. People are sure that gold is hidden in the world's oceans. Anywhere from 10 to 20 million tons of this precious metal can be underwater. But those are not large stones, but tiny particles dissolved in liquid. The extraction of such gold is too expensive. Now, let's find out how people mine gold and turn it into jewelry. At first, 
people find gold deposits, large plots of land or rock inside which gold is hidden. Workers begin to use picks, shovels, and machines to extract shiny pieces from the rock. Then these pieces are dissolved in a special acid that separates the gold from the solids. After that, other substances get removed from the precious metal by melting or using gaseous flora. When the gold is purified, it's checked for purity. 99.9% .9 is the benchmark. Done! Your gold is ready to use. You can turn it into jewelry or part of an electronic device. The rarest metals on Earth also got here from stars. I'm talking about rhodium and iridium. They are several times more expensive than gold, not because of their beauty, but because of their practical value. For example, rhodium and iridium can turn harmful gases into harmless ones, and 90% of the demand for this metal falls on the automaker's market. People use these metals in the manufacturing of auto catalysts. They are needed to clean harmful exhaust. When toxic substances produced during fuel combustion come into contact with these precious metals, they become their safer forms. A micro layer of rhodium and iridium is applied to the walls of the catalyst cylinder. Gold, platinum, rhodium, and iridium are the most expensive metals. But what about the most durable ones? It's a little complicated to determine one winner because the strength of a metal depends on four criteria. First, there's tensile strength. This is the ability of a metal to resist tearing. For example, modeling clay has a low tensile strength because you can easily stretch it in different directions. Among metals, tungsten is perhaps the most difficult to stretch. Another criterion is compressive strength. This is the ability of a metal to resist compression. And here, chrome is one of the strongest. The third criterion for the strength of metals is yield strength. To test this, you need to make a rod or beam from any metal and then try to bend it and break it. The metal that shows the greatest resistance has a high yield strength level. And titanium is pretty good for that. And the fourth criterion is impact strength. This shows how strong the metal is when it gets dropped or hit. In this regard, iron shows a good result. Each metal has its own strong and weak sides. Chrome, for example, has a high resistance to compression, but it's weak if you try to stretch it. Therefore, people make metal alloys to combine their strengths. Okay, we've learned about the rarest and most expensive metals. And what about other elements? What's the rarest substance in the world? Meet astatine, the rarest element on the planet. There are about 0.8 ounces of this substance found in the whole world. The rate of its decay is equal to the speed of its formation. Therefore, the amount of the substance in nature doesn't change. People discussed it in the 1800s and discovered it at the end of the 19th century. But even now, after so many years, we know little about this element. In 1869, the creator of the periodic table, Dmitry Mendeleev, learned that there was a certain substance numbered 85 in the group of halogen elements. This group of non-metals includes such substances as fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So astatine is considered the heaviest of all known halogens and most similar to metals. It has a low melting point and conducts heat and electricity poorly. It's brittle in solid form and has a dark color. Even today, scientists don't know all its properties. It's almost impossible to find it in nature, but chemists have learned to synthesize it artificially. People don't know how to use this element because it's too radioactive. But in some laboratories, scientists conduct experiments using astacine to treat thyroid diseases. Get your closet ready. We're moving to Mercury. Your mission is to find out what you need to wear there to feel comfortable. So, Mercury is the closest planet to the sun in our solar system. It's pretty hot here, about 800 degrees Fahrenheit, twice as much as your kitchen oven can produce. You need a heat reflective suit like this. It looks like foil for duck roasting. The shiny, almost mirror-like surface reflects the heat rays and keeps everything inside from getting baked. That's you. This suit is designed to get to the hearts of volcanoes on Earth. 
and can withstand up to 1,470 degrees Fahrenheit. That's twice as much as at the equator of Mercury. Oh, and bring an oxygen tank. Otherwise, you won't be able to breathe there. And you need to strap some heavy dumbbells to your legs. Mercury is smaller than Earth, and gravity is almost three times weaker here. So you have to increase your weight almost three times to feel comfortable. It gets extremely cold there at night, so you need to stuff your thermal suit with insulation. But even that won't save you from the cold. It's three times colder than at the North Pole. Plus, Mercury's atmosphere doesn't protect you from solar radiation as well as Earth's. So, you need to wear thick lead plates under your suit for protection. But the best thing to do is just evacuate from this planet. The next one is Venus. Although it's called Earth's twin sister, the scenery here looks frightening. A hot desert with volcanoes and clouds so dense that you can barely see the sun. These clouds contribute to the greenhouse effect. So, Venus is the hottest planet in the solar system, 890 degrees Fahrenheit. But the usual heat reflective suit won't help you this time. The atmospheric pressure here is 92 times higher than on the surface of the Earth. That's like diving 3,200 feet underwater. So the air on Venus will just crush you. To survive, you need an airtight suit made of titanium or other sturdy materials. On Earth, we use an atmospheric diving suit like this to withstand the intense pressure underwater. It's like a mini submarine in the shape of a human body. And it's already equipped with an oxygen tank. Yes, the air on Venus is not only unbreathable, it's also toxic. The next planet is Earth. Just look out the window and decide for yourself what to wear today, okay? Let's go to Earth's satellite, the Moon. A few people have been here already, and they were wearing pretty big spacesuits. The main thing is to bring an oxygen tank. It's contained in a backpack along with the life support system. Even though it's cold, there's no atmosphere. It's almost a vacuum, and there's no air particles to take heat from your body, so you won't freeze instantly. Your suit itself should be airtight and keep the atmospheric pressure inside. The lower the pressure, the lower the temperature the fluid can boil over. In space, fluids from your body can evaporate in seconds. You don't want that, so you should wear a spacesuit. It'll also save you from dangerous solar radiation. The moon is defenseless against it. And the gravity here is six times weaker than on Earth. So you can jump six times higher and lift six times more weight. It makes sense to take a little weight with you, so you don't feel as clumsy as the first astronauts. Next up, Mars. In summer, you could walk around here in shorts and a t-shirt. The highest recorded temperature here is about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. In colder times, you'd have to wear a sweater and a warm jacket here, maybe even two. The average temperature here is slightly colder than the coldest point on Earth. But the atmospheric pressure here is frustrating. It's 170 times less than we're used to. Take the altitude at which commercial airplanes fly on Earth. Multiply it by three. The conditions there are very similar to those on Mars. It's cold and there's no oxygen to breathe. Without a spacesuit, you'd last two minutes at most on Mars. So you need an airtight spacesuit on you all the time on the surface of Mars. NASA scientists are preparing a new generation of spacesuits that will allow astronauts to climb, crawl, and bend without difficulty. You'd feel like a real athlete on the surface of Mars. The gravity there is three times weaker than on Earth, so you could easily lift an animal the size of a tiger there. Don't forget to put a spacesuit on it, of course. Now let's fly through the asteroid belt further into space and arrive at Jupiter. It's the largest planet in our solar system, and it's a gas giant. That means there's no solid surface, so you can't even stand there. Although, hypothetically, you could jump into Jupiter. Then you'd keep falling all the way to the planet's core. Suppose you're standing on a platform just above the surface of the planet. The first thing you feel is the force of gravity. It's 2.5 times stronger here. You feel it pulling you down, and you can barely even jump up. So it would be nice to equip your spacesuit with an exoskeleton to support your body and help you move. Plus, it's incredibly cold. You'll feel the cold at about negative 229 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface of the clouds of the gas giant. And what makes things worse is the constant wind. 
it can reach speeds of up to 900 miles per hour, almost twice as fast as the speed of commercial airplanes on Earth. That kind of cold wind will instantly draw heat away from your body, so your spacesuit must be really thick and warm. But the pressure at the top of these clouds is almost the same as on Earth. Technically, you could even take off your helmet here if it weren't for the lack of oxygen and severe cold. Maybe Saturn promises better conditions. Another gas giant. The gravitational force here is almost the same as on Earth, so nothing will constrain your movements, except for a massive spacesuit. It's even colder here than on Jupiter, and the pressure here is about the same as about 15 feet underwater on Earth. So, the spacesuit not only lets you breathe and stay warm, but keeps your eardrums intact. Hey, hold on tight! You just almost got blown away by a gust of wind over 1,100 miles per hour. That's not unusual on Saturn. That kind of wind on Earth could get you from one coast of the United States to another in just two and a half hours. The only option to warm up here is to jump down to the center of the planet. The closer you get to the core, the warmer it gets. But the pressure rises at a tremendous rate. In just a few seconds of freefall, even the toughest titanium suit will be crushed. Let's finally step onto a solid surface, Titan, Saturn's moon. It's 1.5 times the size of our moon and 80% heavier. And its surface is mostly composed of water, ice, and rock. The pressure here is a little bit higher than on Earth. You wouldn't feel any discomfort if it weren't extremely cold. Titan is 9.5 times further from the Sun than Earth, so our star can barely warm this moon. The air here is mostly nitrogen, just like on Earth. But oxygen is completely absent here, so it's impossible to breathe without a spacesuit. There may be a huge ocean beneath Titan's surface. Saturn's gravity heats up this moon's core enough to make the ice melt. Plus, it must be extremely salty, which means it can remain liquid even at very low temperatures. The next two planets are Uranus and Neptune. So Uranus holds the record for the coldest planet in our solar system. The temperature here is about negative 224 degrees Celsius, so bring the warmest spacesuit you have. They say if you jump to the center of Uranus, at one point the pressure becomes so high that it turns hydrogen into a crust of ice. And if you get even lower, you can see the rocky core. Neptune, in turn, holds the record for the strongest winds in the solar system. It's an ice giant, just like Uranus. So the dress code here is the usual. A super warm spacesuit, a tank of oxygen, and a heating system. So far, we don't have the kind of spacesuit that would help you survive on any of the gas giants. But if you get to the core of Neptune, it gets too hot. Its temperature is almost the same as on the surface of the sun. Under the burning sun, among the sand dunes, somewhere in the Sahara Desert, you're walking in search of an ancient treasure. Finally, you find a strange rock in the sand. It's big, looks like a large piece of black coal or rock, but something shiny on its surface makes the rock unusual. This unique find is the oldest thing that has ever been discovered on our planet. This rock was born long before Earth appeared in outer space. The unusual meteorite was found in 2020 in a remote area of the Sahara Desert. Scientists have analyzed the isotopes of magnesium and aluminum on the stone's surface and found that its age is about 4.5 billion years. At the moment, this is the oldest sample of magma from space in history. It belongs to a small protoplanet that didn't have time to form completely. It happened a very long time ago when our solar system was forming. Many huge asteroids were floating in space. Some of them were formed into huge celestial bodies, which later became planets. The big rocky planets were absorbing the smaller ones. The rock was part of a little protoplanet that just began its formation, but another huge asteroid destroyed it. The planet shattered into billions of pieces. Some of them became part of other planets. Some flew outside the solar system and one piece that had been wandering in space until our Earth was formed. After that, it hit the planet's atmosphere and fell into the territory now known as the Sahara Desert. The rock was discovered in 2020, but the erosion of extraterrestrial rocks shows that it could have fallen much earlier. This ancient thing weighing around 70 pounds has several pieces of different meteorites inside. 
In simple words, it's a volcanic rock consisting of lava. It has cooled, solidified, and crystallized. That's why you notice the glitter. Scientists hope that further study of the rock will help to learn more about our solar system foundation. The biggest asteroid discovered in the U.S. is the Willamette. Its size is 84 square feet, and its weight is more than 15 tons. This is half the weight of a bus. Several people can fit on the surface of this outer space object. But the coolest thing is that it's not a rock like most meteorites that were found. Willamette is made of nickel and iron. This massive piece of metal was discovered in 1906. Now, the huge rock is kept at the American Museum of Natural History. The largest meteorite ever found is Hoba. It's located in Namibia, and people have never changed its position because it's too heavy. The weight of Hoba is 60 tons. It's heavier than a tank. The next space-related event occurred on February 28th in southwest England. On this day, a huge flash lit up the sky. Then there was a loud crash. Several residents opened the doors of their houses and noticed a black sooty spot on the lawn. They immediately guessed what had happened and reported the discovery to the British Meteorite Observation Network. If you ever find a meteorite, report it to some geological research or space center as soon as possible. The longer a space rock lies on the ground, the faster it loses its value. Rain, dust, snow, wind, scorching sun, all these factors damage the surface of the meteorite. It makes it difficult to study the celestial object. The meteorite found in England looks like coal, but it's way softer and more fragile. It most likely used to contain frozen water. The rock is part of a huge asteroid that plowed through outer space when our solar system hadn't fully formed yet. They found a unique combination of minerals inside the rock. It can help scientists learn more about the origins of the solar system and life on Earth. Now we're heading to Germany, to the small town of Nördlingen. A huge ancient meteorite's hidden here. It's very difficult to notice it unless you know the secret of this town. You're walking along the cozy little streets and looking at the buildings with beautiful architecture. You spend the whole day there and don't find anything that reminds you of a meteorite. To solve the mystery, you need to get out of town. So you climb a high hill and see that the city is located inside a pit. For a long time, locals were sure the house was located in the crater of an extinct volcano. If you look at the houses from a certain angle, you may notice an unusual shining coming from them. In the middle of the 20th century, a group of geologists came here and immediately declared that the crater doesn't look like a volcanic one. The town was built on a huge crater left by a meteorite. The huge celestial body fell here about 15 million years ago. It was so hot that the carbon bubbles inside instantly turned into small diamonds. When people were building this city, they didn't know they were using expensive stones, since the diamonds were hardly visible. The locals never attached importance to the fact that the city walls shine unusually in the sun. Now they believe this place was built from diamonds that had fallen from the sky. Our next stop is in the UK again. This time, the rocks are of an earthly origin. The famous Stonehenge. People place circles of rocks here in a certain order. Everyone knows about this archaeological monument, but no one knows the reason for its creation for certain. Another construction built out of mysterious rocks was discovered just two miles away. It's called Superhenge. It's bigger, heavier, and takes up more space. Each plate here is 15 feet, which is about the height of two floors. Once, the stone stood vertically and formed a huge semicircle. But someone pushed the stones over about 4,500 years ago. It was a college prank. No, not really. That's why they couldn't be detected for a long time. Scientists still can't solve the mystery of Superhenge, but they believe the standing vertical stones were part of some huge monument. Some other amazing rocks are located in the south of Costa Rica. There are big ones the size of a human, and there are smaller ones the size of bowling balls. And they all have a perfectly round shape. These giant rocky spheres were created by people. It must have taken years of polishing using stone tools to get the perfect round shape. These balls are incredibly heavy, but can easily roll like a basketball. All the rocks are of a different age. Some of them were created about 2,500 years ago. Most of them are made of molten volcanic magma. 
Until now, scientists don't know for what purpose these stones were used. They were found in different parts of Costa Rica, near big cities. It's possible that ancient civilizations installed them specifically to show the greatness of local kings. Also, many experts believe the rocks were used as a tool for studying astronomy. The people who knew their purpose of the rocks had disappeared, and the history of the stones was lost along with them. Let's finish our journey with the coolest archaeological find. You're walking through the desert of Peru and climbing a low hill. You look down and notice the surface of the hill is covered with strange lines. You walk far away and see a huge cat on the hill. Such a drawing is called a geoglyph. Its length is around 120 feet, which is about half the size of a Boeing commercial jet. Archaeologists discovered the giant cat in 2020 and found out that it had been created somewhere between 200 and 100 BCE. This huge drawing is part of a mysterious group of different pictures. In addition to the cat, there are other animals, plants, and fantastic figures. All of them were found in the desert of Peru. The kitten was found by chance. Archaeologists didn't see it at first because natural erosion on the hillside had almost erased the silhouette.